Good morning. Welcome to, to um, First Baptist Church, and we're so glad that you're here today to worship with us. We want to know that you're here, so at the end of your pew, there's a friendship register, so if you'd fill that out, let us know that you're here. If you're watching online, please text your name and those watching with you to the number on your screen. If you would like to follow along by accessing the worship guide, you can scan the QR code on your screen. And a reminder that we have extended our baby bottle campaign to the end of this month. And Life Choices Roanne has an event planned for Friday, July 28th from 11 to 1. Um, they will have food trucks, a radio or a ra live radio DJ. Um, they're going to have tours of the facility. So if you are able to come and join them, it's Life Choices Rowan, 847 South Main Street. Please keep our children and our youth and our access friends in your prayers this week. The children leave for South Mountain tomorrow. Our youth are returning today from a week in Baltimore. And our access friends leave for happiness retreat on Thursday. We have several upcoming events for youth and children. So if you're interested in any of those events, please um, see myself or Brian. There's a men's gathering next Sunday, July 30th at 530 in the Fellowship Hall. More information for that you can find from Pete Teague. Our senior adults have a Bible study coming up in October, October 2nd through the 3rd, and you can sign up for that on the senior bulletin board across from the kitchen. And I know the kids, kids in here, you might want to close your ears, and any teachers too. Um, but the start of school is coming up, it's just around the corner, I'm sorry. Uh, we have started collecting school supplies to donate to communities and schools, and I spoke with the executive director there, and he said there is a particularly great need for supplies this year. Um, I saw that some people have already brought in supplies. My, my um, tubs are almost full, so thank you so much for doing that. And now I'd like to invite Eleanor Henson to come and give our invocation. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, thank you that we all have the opportunity to gather here and worship you today. Lord, we pray that our hearts and minds be open this morning and that we hear and receive your message. We pray that we are able to use this morning's message to reach the people around us this week. We thank you so much for everything you've blessed us with and will continue to bless us with. In your name we pray, amen. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all of the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. I know that the Lord is great, that our God is greater than all gods. Please stand as we sing together. God is greater. 
nothing good in me. You are love, you are love, on display for all to see. You are light, you are light, when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sin. The Missions Council first introduced you to R.C. and Bree Brunstetter back in December. They are IMB missionaries serving in Slovenia, and we talked to them as part of our Lottie Moon emphasis. And at that time, they were still fairly new to the mission field, young couple with a two-month-old. And when we met them uh, at that time, um, Bree had had some health challenges after delivery. Um, the baby had been in the hospital as well, and they were just going through a tough time, but they persevered. We've continued to stay in touch with them through texts and emails since that time, and we've been encouraged 
by uh, their faith and their spirit and uh, the, the works that they're doing and the results that they're seeing. And they had informed us about a month or so ago that they think they will be ready for a mission team to come and help them in February. So our church is gonna be their first mission team to come and serve with them on the field in Slovenia. We're putting together a small team to do some prayer walking, to do some testimony training, and just to love on and support this sweet, sweet young family. We uh, asked them to do a video to let you see them again, see how they're doing six months later. They've been on the mission field now a little more than a year, and it was really uplifting to me to see them again and to see how healthy and happy they look now. And, um, and excited and just um, glorying in the work that, that they see God is doing through them there in Slovenia. And we're happy to partner with them through prayer and financial gifts to make that work possible. So I hope you'll enjoy this um, brief little visit with R.C. and Bree. Good morning, church. Uh, we're excited to update you uh, on our family and how the work here in Slovenia. Uh, two weeks ago, we had a baptism for three new believers on the year. Uh, we have set a record for the last 20 years of people baptized. Uh, we're just really excited to see the work that God continues to do. <laughs> and an update on our family. Uh, we're doing super great. Little Lincoln's crawling up a storm, <laughs> thinking he'll take his first step soon. Um, and we're looking forward to meeting little baby Callahan in November. Uh, and looking forward to February uh, to see one of our churches come out and, and spend some time with us and the work here. Um, the, the foundation of what we do is prayer based. And so we're really looking forward to being able to spend time prayer walking different cities around us. There are many totally unengaged cities here. Uh, no Christian presence whatsoever. Um, and the foundation of the work here is prayer. And so being able to go in and, and spend time walking the streets and, and praying and, and even seeing if we can get into conversations with people about the gospel and about Jesus. Um, we want to uh, lay that foundation so in the future when we send workers into these cities, uh, prayer will already be happening there. Um, as well as uh, being able to spend time with new believers. Like we said, we have some uh, this year, hopefully more to come by February, uh, and just talking with them about how to share their testimony, how to share with their friends and their family. Uh, we're really excited, church, to, to have you join us in our work here, uh, and we look forward uh, to, to planning that and to having you here in February. We love you guys. Thank you so much for your support and for your prayers. Bye. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm excited to see our young missionaries that through your giving and faithful giving over the years and presently, uh, give them the opportunity to be there. I'm also excited because I'm prayerfully uh, giving strong consideration to go in Slovenia with the small group. So if you'll join me in that. So when I see them up there, I get even more excited about the possibilities of prayer walking teaching how to give a testimony. Um, I'm excited. I've never been out of the country, so I, I'm really looking forward to this opportunity, um, looking ahead. But it wouldn't happen, even you at home that are watching online or watching the tape, thank you for your faithful giving that allows for the ministry, for the gospel, for Jesus to be shared and new believers coming on board or joining us in eternity. Father, we are thankful for the opportunity to give once again. And it is exciting to see how the fruits of the labor, but also the giving and financial support that is so critical for this young family and others like them to be on the field, in the mission field. Even those around us here, there's so much opportunity. May the message this morning the preacher gives inspire us inspire us to not only give but to serve to shine our light as we move forward bless this offering and our tithes bless our prayers i pray in jesus name amen
There is a candle in every soul, some brightly burning, some dark and cold. There is a spirit who brings a fire, ignites a candle, and makes his home carry.
Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to see you. Thank you for coming out and worshiping with us today. Thank you for being here on a, a cool morning, right? I guess, relatively speaking, a nice cool spell. Uh, appreciate your attendance today. If you will take your Bibles, I encourage you to open those or turn those on, whatever your preference is. Uh, we will be coming out of Philippians chapter 2, picking up where we left off last time, Philippians chapter 2. Uh, we're going to begin reading in verse 12 and read down through verse 18. Uh, thematically, we're talking a little bit about light, as you can tell, light that lives and exists within us and shines from us in a world that is very dark. Paul here in this particular text is encouraging the Philippians uh, by the way they live their life to shine as stars in a very dark and a depressing world. Philippians chapter 2 beginning in verse 12 reading down through verse 18. Our sermon title is just that, Shine Like Stars. I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible, follow along in your favorite translation. Verse 12, therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who's working in you, both to will and to work according to his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling and arguing, so that you may be blameless and pure, children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine like stars in the world by holding firm to the word of life. Then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing. But even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. In the same way, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. Shine like stars. Uh, stars do have a tendency to stand out when they are twinkling against the night sky, don't they? Uh, have you ever been in a situation where maybe you stood out? Maybe it was for a good reason or for a bad reason. Sometimes we stand out. I remember the neighborhood, small rural community in which I grew up. Uh, Mormons, they always just kind of stood out, did they not? Dark pants, white shirt, name tag, bicycles. Uh, they'd get about two houses in and then the phone tree would start up and everybody would start calling. Uh, curtains would close, doors would lock, nobody would answer it. Uh, never had much luck in my community, but they were very easy to spot whenever they showed up. I think probably the most uh, out of place or the most standout-ish that I've ever felt uh, was whenever we had an opportunity to go to China and adopt our son. Uh, in China, I'd never been the minority walking around, and, and you just kind of have a self-awareness whenever that happens. I remember taking a, a few days while we were waiting on paperwork. We went to the, the Great Wall of China, and there were several shops right uh, at the bottom of the steps before you get actually onto the wall, and I bought a, a rice paddy hat because it's the only hat I could find. Uh, and I noticed people wanted to take pictures with me. Uh, I thought it was the hat to begin with, but... Uh, very short, very small Chinese men would walk up with the telephone and uh, they would want to stand beside me and have their picture taken with me. Uh, I, I asked our interpreter, I said, what's going on? I said, uh, my hat's not that grand. I mean, I bought it for five bucks right over there. And they said, no, these folks, many of them are from villages. They've just never seen a white man before. And they're going to take pictures of it and verify it and take it back and show their friends back in their village. Um, I felt like a rock star just taking pictures of <laughs> Chinese people on the Great Wall of China just for being me, but I did feel like I was standing out just a little bit. Um, Paul is encouraging that, not by outward appearances, mind you, but by the way we live our lives. Uh, he has just finished writing that great Christ hymn of chapter 2. Uh, he is encouraging us to have the very mind of Christ, adopt the attitude of Christ, to lower ourselves and allow the Father to do the exalting uh, and he's saying, if you live that pattern of life, it's going to look different than everybody else. It's going to stand out like stars against a nighttime sky. Uh, we're going to be contrary swimming upstream according to the value system of the world. Paul says, do it anyway. Uh, he's encouraging the Philippians and he's encouraging us to live a life that shines like stars. 
Now, he gives us a few uh, examples here, a few ways in which we can live and behave and conduct ourselves and think uh, in such a way so that we stand out, not to draw attention to ourselves, mind you, but so that our differences can draw attention to the Christ who changed us. Let's go ahead and jump in a little bit this morning here. Point number one, how in the world do we go about shining like stars? Point number one, with our activity, with our activity. Look at verses 12 and 13 again. Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. Let's go ahead and talk about what this verse is not teaching. Let's go ahead and address that. Uh, Two main things I believe we need to understand. Uh, What this verse is not teaching, number one, is that we work for our salvation. It is not teaching that we work for our salvation. Uh, It is very clear. We always interpret scripture in light of other scripture. We see the Bible as a whole. And it's clear that our salvation, our rebirth, our forgiveness of sins, our justification, it is a work of grace uh, given to us as a gift through faith that we place in Christ. So there's nothing that we could ever do to earn salvation. You can't be good enough. You can't give enough. You can't attend the right church or be a part of the right family or be a part of the right denomination. Uh, None of these things. You can't be baptized enough teach enough classes, do enough works of charity. You can't do anything except bring our sins to the foot of the cross. And when we reach out and receive this free gift of salvation, it starts and ends with grace. So Paul is not teaching here that we work for our salvation. He's not teaching that we work in order to keep our salvation. He's not teaching that either uh, because it is a work of grace again from start to finish. It is all him. It is not what we do, it's what he has done to secure our eternal salvation. So he's not teaching salvation is something we work for, and he's not teaching that salvation is something we work so that we might keep and maintain it, uh, but he is teaching that work is involved with salvation. Uh, as James would say, uh, faith without works is a dead faith. Because we've been changed, because we know Christ, because we have this free gift, the activity of our life will reflect that. Uh, He is saying, in essence, work out to completion your salvation. We have been changed and we have been given a, uh, a new heart and a new spirit and a new life and that needs to be worked out and expressed. Our salvation is not a a ending point. Uh, We often see uh, our coming to Christ as a a final ending point when actually it's the beginning. Uh, Paul is saying, work that out. There is a plan and there is a purpose for your life. There's a great commission to accomplish. There is love for our neighbor that needs to be expressed. There's worship that needs to be expressed and exercised in our life. Work that out until it's intended fruition and maturity. Not saying work for your salvation, but rather work it out. You already possess it by grace. Uh, Work it out to its intended logical end. You know, speaking of birthdays, I know we have Hannah's birthday today, but just a couple weeks ago we had Joseph's birthday. Uh, he turned 11. Isn't it? July's expensive around my house. I don't know. We just have all these <laughs> birthday cakes and parties and dinners. And, uh, but for his birthday, Joseph wanted Legos. Uh, one thing he is good at is uh, putting together a Lego set. Uh, we buy him one set in, in a day, he's got it done. So we buy him a little bigger set, you know, a day and a half, he's, he's got it done. Once he put his mind uh, to putting that together, there, nothing else. He'll skip meals. He won't take a bath. He's just going to focus on it until it's done. Uh, so for his birthday a couple weeks ago, I went to the Lego store in Charlotte and bought him a 3,000-piece Lego set. I said, boy, we're going to keep you busy for just a little while. Uh, if you're into Marvel, it is just a big head of the Black Panther. That's what it is. Uh, on the outside of the box, it says intended for 18 years and older. He's just turned 11. Uh, so we're going to keep you busy. Uh, now, he didn't earn that box, but there's an intended purpose for what's inside of the box. We bought it. We gave it to him. Uh, it was a gift. 
He's about halfway through with it already, and he's only worked on it just a few days. He did get a little frustrated, and he's taking a break right now. He's taking a break. Uh, but I have full confidence that he will finish it. But we bought it. We gave it to him. Uh, it was a gift, but the intended purpose is not for the Legos to just stay in the box. Uh, the intended purpose is not for them to just stay in the bag, but rather they have a function that they need to perform. They need to get put together, and Black Panther needs to come to life, and I need to set it on top of his dresser. Excuse me, because he's already got a place picked out for it. Our salvation also, <clears throat> our salvation also uh, has an intended purpose to be lived out. Not simply to be possessed, but also to be expressed in our activity and in our work. Paul's saying, I want you to work out your salvation. Let it live. Let it breathe. Let it be expressed. Let it be evident so that attention can be drawn not to us, but rather attention can be drawn to Christ. Uh, there's one way I want us to really think about applying this. Uh, we mentioned about living out and expressing our intended purpose. <clears throat> can I encourage you for just a moment? There is nobody else in the world like you. There never has been, there never will be anybody else in the world just like you. And for some of us, that's good, right? That is a good thing. But there's no one with the experiences that, that you've had exactly. There's no one with the, the mixture of giftedness that you have exactly. There is no one with strengths and weaknesses put together in such a way as you have exactly. In other words, there will never be, nor has there ever been, another you. You are fearfully and you are wonderfully made and God has a very specific plan for your life. God desires to use you for his glory to accomplish his great commission. God desires you to serve. He has a plan and he has a will and he has something that he wants you to be involved in. But if we're not careful, we'll forget about our activity being God-based. We'll forget about our activity in life being kingdom focused and, and Christ centered and we will live life to our own desire and our own liking. Paul says, be careful about this. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Fear and trembling. Uh, an awe and a wonder and a respect at exactly who God is and what God has done. We understand that we have this fear and trembling that is lacking in many of our churches and many of our lives and especially in our culture today. This respectful wonder and amazement at God and even courtesy for one another. Uh, work it out with fear and trembling because of who God is. Work it out in fear and trembling because we are aware of His presence. We are aware that whatever we're doing to live our lives, God is with us. Wherever we go and whatever we do, every success, God is with us. Every failure, God is with us. Every righteous choice, God is with us. And every unrighteous choice, God is with us. So with a hint of fear and trembling, we go out and we live our lives, recognizing that He is with us. Whenever we begin dating, receive some great advice uh, from a saged saint. So when you begin dating, go out on a date, take your Bible with you and put it just right there in the seat and you're aware of God's presence. And to get at one another, you have to crawl over Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to get to, <laughs> to, get to each other. It's just a great reminder of God's presence and that should bring a sense of awe and a sense of fear and a little sense of trembling. Also because of judgment. You know how we live or fail to live our life is something we will give an account for. Now, when I talk about judgment, I'm not talking about salvation. That judgment has been settled on the cross and with the exclamation of the resurrection. Our salvation in Christ is settled. If we have received him, he has received us. That is settled for all of eternity. But we will have to give an account for how we lived our lives. We will give an account for every deed. We will give an account for every thought, every sin committed and every work of righteousness omitted from our lives, we will have to give an account. So the activity of our life, that which makes us different, which makes us stand out like stars against the backdrop of the night, it should be lived out in such a way that we can stand before God into judgment and not hang our heads. He does give some encouragement for this. 
He says, yeah, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 13 is there, though. For it is God who is working in you, both to will and to work according to his good purpose. Again, God's not going to throw us to the wolves, and he's not going to leave us on our own. Even the desire to do what is good and to live a life that is Christ-centered and God-focused is a work of his. So God creates within us the desire to do it. Then he gives us the ability to get the job done. Uh, Where do you fit in in the kingdom of God? Where is your spot among his people and among his body? What is it that God has uniquely created you to do? Does that take up the activity and the energy and the focus of your life? Maybe you're here today and you say, I don't know what God wants me to do. Uh, Maybe you're thinking, I I can be a preacher or I can be a singer or I can be a missionary, but I... Wherever you are, I want you to be all there for the kingdom. Do you realize God has people in the military? He has people in schools. He has people in law enforcement and in factories and working for the city. God has people all over the place. But we need to be mindful that we're doing what God desires for us to do and do it for him and for his glory. What are you doing for the Lord? It's not to earn salvation, it's not to keep salvation, but it's from a grateful heart because we have it. So we are different because we live our lives differently, and we stand out and we shine like stars. Secondly, how is it that we are going to be different? Well, we're different with our activity, the way we live and for whom we live our lives. Secondly, with our conversation, we shine like stars because our conversation is different. Look with me at verse 14. Do everything. That's everything. Do everything without grumbling and arguing. So that you may be blameless and pure children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine like stars in the world. Grumbling and complaining. That that is our go-to default for our human nature, isn't it? Uh, To be grumblers, to be arguers, to be complainers, to be negative all of the time. Uh, We go back to the Old Testament, right? You remember when God's children were delivered through Moses uh, from the land of Egypt. No sooner than Egypt was in the rear view mirror, what did they begin doing? They began complaining. The word is murmuring. They began just murmuring. They began complaining. Why didn't you leave us in Egypt? You brought us out here so we could die in the wilderness. At least we'd have a little something to eat. And they began murmuring and complaining and arguing amongst themselves and against their leadership. And and God admonished them. If we're not careful, we can fall into the same trap. If we are not careful, we can fall into that aspect of our nature. If we are not careful, we can busy ourselves with a conversation of complaint and grumbling and arguing. And the point is not a mouth issue, but the point is a heart issue. Jesus taught that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So it's not simply about words, but it's because our mouth is connected to our hearts. And it's what that reflects whenever the words are coming out. So Paul's encouraging the Philippians, do everything, everything. Uh, Even if you disagree, even if you're having a, a, a dialogue, even if you're having a debate of some kind, do it without arguing, complaining, and murmuring without all of the negativity. Instead, I want to encourage us to do something else. I spoke just this week because I wanted to verify. I spoke just this week with a, with a trained psychologist. And I had read somewhere that your brain, kind of funny, it's kind of a funny thing, but the part of your brain that operates whenever we complain and whenever we argue and whenever we are fearful and whenever we are anxious, the that that part of your brain can only handle one thing at the time. So if we are behaving that way, what we lack is gratitude and joy. And whenever we are grateful and whenever we are joyful and whenever we choose that, that we can't be worried and anxious and grumbling and complaining, it can't occur at the same time. We're going to be in one place or the other. And so what should we do instead of arguing and instead of grumbling and instead of complaining and instead of murmuring, instead of focusing on the negative, can I encourage you with simply one word, gratitude. Gratitude. To stop for just a moment and be grateful. Wouldn't we be so vastly different from the world? 
if we lived a lifestyle and a pattern of gratitude. Maybe now for just a moment, might we, might we just think of a few things that we are grateful for. It's awful hard to complain and murmur and cause arguments whenever we are grateful. What would our lives look like? How different would they be if we woke up every morning and as soon as our eyes opened, instead of saying, good Lord, it's morning, we say, good morning, Lord, and we begin thinking about the goodness he has bestowed upon us. God, thank you for my family. God, thank you for a good night's rest. Thank you for my bed and for the groceries that are in my refrigerator now. Thank you for health and thank you for the ability to get up and walk around. Thank you for the freedom to come and gather and worship without, without fear and without punishment. Uh, thank you for my eternal salvation that is firm and steadfast in Jesus Christ. Uh, thank you for snatching me from the very pits of hell and placing me in your family. What if we exercised gratitude just a little more? How different would our lives be? How different would our churches be? How different would the world even around us be? Because we would stand out like a sore thumb, like me on the Great Wall of China. We would be different than everything and everybody else around us. And I believe that when we exercise gratitude, we honor our God. He didn't just say, don't grumble and complain. But as we look at other scripture, we also have to replace that with something. The Bible talks about putting off the old man, but we need to put on the new man. Empty spaces don't stay empty very long. Your junk drawer in your kitchen is living proof of that, right? Uh, there's not a one of you in here that doesn't have at least one junk drawer. I have two. I'm very proud of that. We have two in our kitchen. Looking for homes here in the Salisbury area. Uh, you walk around, you look at the bathrooms, you look at the kitchen, and you say, hey, that'll be a great junk drawer. That'll be fantastic. I think we're going to buy this particular home. Now, you can clean that sucker out all you want to, but it won't take two days before it just fills right back up again. Uh, closets are like that. Junk drawers are like that. We are like that. Uh, so we don't want to just stop complaining and, and bickering and murmuring and focusing on the negative. We want to replace that with something that is good and Christ-honoring. Gratitude. I suggest gratitude. So may you be a grateful people and May that reflect in our conversation as we talk to others and as we engage others. And may it make us drastically different than the world which is around us. Shining like stars, how are we going to do it? Well, we do it with our activity, what we busy ourselves with. May it be good, may it be godly, may we live out our calling. We are different with our conversation because our conversation is linked to our heart. Because our hearts are different, our conversation is different. And I think a great change that can be made is whenever we focus on gratitude, it'll change our attitude, it'll change our conversation, it'll change the way we interact with others. And then finally, number three, we can shine like stars, we can be different with our proclamation. Proclamation, let's explain that. Verse 16, by holding firm to the word of life, then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing. But even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. In the same way, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. Verse 16 there is a little bit tricky whenever we look at our English Bibles. In verse 16, when we talk about this word of life, uh, we know the word of life is a person. His name is Jesus, and it's also a message that we call the gospel. In verse 16, and this translation in particular, and maybe some of yours, by holding firm to the word of life, it misses a little element. Now, the Amplified Bible kind of explains it uh, in a good way. It's holding it out as an offering. We are holding it fast, but we are holding it out and offering it to others. Uh, the Amplified picks up on that. John MacArthur has written much in his commentary about that. So we're speaking about sharing this word of life. We're speaking of proclaiming the good news and sharing Jesus with a dark and a dying world that desperately needs him. According to my most recent research, and even if these numbers are somewhat close, 96% of Christians will live their entire Christian life and never share the gospel with another human being. 96%. 
Do you realize we have that responsibility and that privilege to tell people about the Christ who saves us? Not in haughtiness, not in self-righteousness. We're simply beggars telling other beggars where to find bread, right? But we have this great privilege and this great responsibility to tell others about Christ, but we are not doing it. Uh, Perhaps it's a fear of rejection. Perhaps there's sin in our life and it's kind of holding us back from going forward to tell others about Jesus. Maybe it's just downright disobedience. Uh, But we have a privilege and a responsibility to get the gospel message into the darkest recesses of the world. Now, you're going to be a little different and you're going to stand out and you're going to shine like stars whenever that occurs. But that's okay. Do it. Do it anyway. You may be thinking, well, I'm not very good at that. Uh, I remember some professors I sat under as I had some time in seminary, and some of these guys were extremely gifted at sharing the gospel. They could walk up and lead a tree to Jesus. I mean, it was just, they were that gifted that they could have a conversation, they could bring the gospel right into the center of it. And some would say, why don't we just leave it to them? Those folks that are gifted to do it, everybody doesn't have the same gift. And This professor in particular, he said, no, no, we all may not have the gift of evangelism, but we all have the responsibility. Uh, We all have that privileged responsibility to tell someone about Christ. When's the last time you parted your lips to tell someone the good news? It doesn't have to be a theological treatise. It, It doesn't. It doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be complicated. In fact, can I give you one point of application? I think one great way to begin gospel conversations is simply to share your testimony. Share your testimony. Uh, Here are three points I want you to remember, and I want to challenge you this week to share your testimony with someone, even if it's someone you already know well, even if you think they're a Christian, even if they are a Christian, just share your testimony. And three easy things to remember. Uh, Number one, just tell them about your life before Jesus. What was life like before Jesus? What did you do with your time? Uh, What did your value system look like? Uh, How was your conversation? How did you spend your money? Uh, What kind of places did you visit and where did you go? What was important? What brought you joy? What was life like before Jesus came? Second thing, tell them how you met Jesus. Maybe you were sitting in a church service like this one and maybe a preacher was preaching and he shared the gospel with you and God gripped your heart and brought you close. Uh, Maybe you were riding in your car and you heard a a song on the radio, or maybe a friend shared their testimony with you, but somewhere along the way you encountered Christ. Somewhere along the way, maybe you read a book, or, or God just gripped your heart in some way, and share, tell them how that happened. Uh, maybe you were at vacation Bible school, right? Or maybe you were in kids' church, who knows? But tell them life before Jesus. Tell them how you came to know Christ, and tell them what Jesus is doing in your life now. That's, it's not just for way back then. I can say, hey, I was nine when I received Christ. That's going on 40 years ago, guys. I mean, not too far away, 40 years ago. uh, What's the big deal? He's still working in me, and he's still working on me, and he is still good, and he's still alive, and he's still well, and he's still nurturing and guiding and growing. Tell him what Christ is doing in your life now. And who knows what kind of conversation that will turn into. You may have an opportunity to share that Christ wants to change them also, that Christ desires them also. That this transformation is not just for us, but it's for any who will call upon the name of Christ. You never know what he'll do whenever we begin sharing our testimony. But great day, guys. We've got to do something. 96%. If that's even close to right, uh, that is a dishonor to the Christ who saved us. Will you take the challenge? Will you share your testimony? Will you tell someone about Jesus in some kind of a way? Maybe it's over lunch, maybe it's over the phone, maybe it's a post on Facebook. Any of those can count. May we simply get the gospel message out. So strange people, yep, we are different. In fact, if we live a life as a Christ follower, if we wake up every day and we pick up our cross, we deny ourselves, we follow him, we're going to stand out like stars shining against the night sky. And we can stand out because of our activity, what we live life for, what we do with our energy and our focus, our talents and treasure and time. We stand out with our conversation because that is linked to our heart. Our heart's been changed. Our conversation is different. And we avoid the complaining and the murmuring and the the arguing. We avoid all the negativity. We avoid that. We are different. And we're different because of our proclamation. 
we want people to know about Jesus. We want people to know the life-saving message of the gospel. So our concluding thought as we walk away is simply this. How brightly are you shining? How brightly are you shining? Have you received Christ? Maybe you're thinking, maybe you're thinking to yourself this morning, well, I can't really tell somebody about Jesus. I've never received and trusted in Christ myself. What in the world are you waiting on? May today be a day of change and renewal and rebirth and forgiveness for you. Maybe you've been a Christian for years, but you haven't really taken it very seriously. Maybe today is a good day to repent and to change that. Uh, we're going to have a hymn of invitation here in just a moment, and it's a great time. Uh, if you would like to pray, I'll be down front uh, if I can pray with you about something. Uh, maybe right where you are if you'd like to do business with God and respond to shining like stars or however he's spoken to your heart. Uh, I, just simply, I just simply want you to do that. In fact, can I pray for you now before we go into our time of invitation? And we invite you to come. Also, we have some prayer cards down front. Uh, our friends in our access ministry, they're going on a happiness retreat, and they really desire to have you pray for them. Uh, so maybe before you leave or at our invitation time, you can come down and grab a card and be praying for them this week. Uh, whatever your need might be, you are invited. Let me pray for you. Father, you are good. Uh, you are light. Uh, you are holy. Uh, and Father, it's a joy to know you through your son, Jesus. Uh, Father, I'm asking this morning that you would forgive us where we have failed you. Uh, forgive us where we have not found our deepest and highest satisfaction in you. Forgive us for uh, being disobedient. Forgive us, Father, for not being grateful. Uh, forgive us for not sharing more the good message of the gospel. Uh, Father, wherever we have sinned, I pray you would forgive us. And Father, I pray for these. I pray for these who are listening and those that will listen even later. That, Father, you would continue to do a work in us. That, Father, you continue to give us a desire and the ability to work for you, not to earn the free gift of salvation, but, Father, because we're grateful that we have it. Use our lives to make a difference. We don't want to waste one second. Father, help us shine in Jesus' name. Amen. Congregation, very quickly, will you have a seat? We just have one other item that we would like to take care of. Uh, you may have noticed we have Mr. Russ, Pastor Russ, back with us after a couple months of sabbatical. And Russ, it's great to have you. Yeah, great to have you back. Now, wait, 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 wait. I hadn't I ain't gotten to the good part yet. Wait. But while Russ was away, do you know that he celebrated 20 years of service here at First Baptist Church? Let's recognize him now, yes. <laughs> And 
also we know that, that Angela and the family and the boys and such are a huge, huge part. We don't, we don't do this on our own. But, but Russ, on behalf of First Baptist Church, thank you for loving Jesus. Thank you for loving his people. And we look forward to 20 more years, my friend. God bless you. Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, it's definitely uh, wonderful to be back here worshiping uh, with y'all this morning. And I just want to say uh, thank you to the entire church for allowing us this opportunity over the last two months to uh, be able to have a time of rest and rejuvenation and just a special time with family, a uh, time that we normally wouldn't have. And it's uh, been a wonderful time. Uh, and I thank you also for the, uh, the 20 years that uh, we have been here. Does it, in some ways, doesn't seem that long, uh, but it's, uh, we're looking forward to many, many more years. Uh, so thank you so much. Congregation, will you stand? Just want to say thank you for coming out and being here today. I want you to go in the peace of the Lord and shine like stars. You guys are dismissed. God bless you.